Well, the next book in our uh, Summer Read book club in conjunction with WH Smith um, is this one. It's called The Confession of Catherine Howard, and it is what it is really. Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of Henry VIII, what happened to her, and, and really how she grew up, what kind of girl she was. It's absolutely fascinating. If you love historical fiction, you'll be absolutely riveted by it. Um, and the author, Susanna Dunn, is, is here with us now. Hi. Hi. Um, you like, I mean, you write historical fiction anyway, don't you? Well, I do now. I didn't come from that background. Really? Yeah, and I don't think of myself really as writing historical fiction, but it, I write fiction and it's set, <laughs> set, set in a then. historical period, so I guess it yeah, is. Because yeah, because it is very much a story. It's not kind of, it's, it's not a, a kind of, I mean, presumably it is historically accurate. You presumably make sure of that. Absolutely. But it doesn't read like that. It doesn't read like you are reading a treatise oh, on no. what happened to Catherine Howard. No. It's a proper novel. Proper novel. And what really astonished me when I read this was, I had kind of thought, despite Henry VIII's reputation with his wives, which we all know about, I had kind of thought that presumably in those Tudor courts, um, everyone was sort of quite prim and proper. And actually... They were <laughs> at it they, like rabbits. At it yeah, like They were rabbits. Victorians. It, no, well, Victorians no. probably weren't Victorians either. I mean, I don't know. It's not my period of history. But no, the Tudors were an earthy lot. What's interesting is that Catherine, when she became the fifth wife of Henry, she was very, very young, wasn't she? Yes. Uh, about 17, 18? We don't know. No, I mean, in fact, she's a fascinating... We, we, we know almost nothing about her, and we have no idea how young she was. But the guesstimates are between 17 and 19, really. And, and he was, by that time, in his 40s. Yes, he was. And starting to become the Henry that we know from the pictures. Big fat. Filling out. Yeah, slowing down. Because, of course, he hadn't always been like that. You know, we tend to no, forget that. No, he's a young, no, young. Yeah, he's very, very young. attractive. Very yeah. Yeah. Handsome but man. by this point... Yeah, and Catherine was very... Uh, you paint her as being very petite. She was. Like we, a, we think she was. Yeah. Yes. She and was very tiny. pretty, like, like a sort of porcelain doll. Well, do you know, that's interesting you say that, because I don't think I do say that anyway. Sorry to contradict you, Judy. Um, I think what's fascinating about her is we, nobody says she was particularly good looking. Oh. And I, she certainly wasn't classically attractive, and, and not she in the Tudor way. She looks pretty fit to me on the cover, yeah. <laughs> got to be honest. I know, it's a lovely, I think that's I love it. she's great, isn't she? Yeah. Um, but you know, the Tudor ideal, of course, for women would have been pretty well-built, pretty mm. buxom. Yeah. Um, and we don't, we think she was, she was slight. She was a little girl, she was a little girl. Judy talks about the sexual mores of the time, which barely existed. And what's interesting is that because she, she was marrying this kind of fat, rather smelly old king, she felt that gave her licence to continue having having her other liaisons. I think she did. I thought about it long and hard and looked at what her... We, you know, we, we do have her confession. You know, mm. you can go on the internet and find it because, you yes. know, copious notes were yeah. kept at the time mm. uh, of, what, of what she said. And she doesn't say this, but really looking at it, I think that she probably felt, I'm doing a really good job. And she was, you see. He was delighted. This is the awful thing. They'd been married about a year and a half when he found out what was going on. And he was delighted with her. They'd had no problems whatsoever. Um, she'd given him a new lease of life. Uh, court was fun again a lot of people yeah, said yeah. that around that time yeah. it was all going swimmingly and I suspect she thought I'm doing a damn good job and I'm having to do a job so off duty. I think that's, she, what, that's, she, that's what comes through very very yeah. clearly actually in the writing but I must say re, as I was reading I was thinking because we all know what's going to happen to her she's going to lose yes. her head and you think what are you doing to I her? know what are you doing I know she knew about Anne Boleyn yes she knew what happened to Anne Boleyn for right. the same reason yeah so, yeah. yeah but I she convinced think herself. It, it's very hard to know what was going through her mind or, or, or nothing at all going through her mind but I think it was to do with her coterie of friends you know she was very unusual in that she'd brought this close little circle of her friends with her and they'd grown up with her as is shown in the book at her step grandmother's mm -hmm. house yes. that's where they'd all grown up together and I think she thought because they had always made it possible for her they'd always covered for her they'd always supported her they'd always made mm. these liaisons possible and she thought and she was right for, for, for a considerable amount of time that, it, they, yeah. that, they, that, they, that she could continue well, to get away with it. I must ask you this it's only occurred to me towards the back end of the book with their undertones of Princess Diana, in the sense that she began mm. to run a separate court and she had her liaisons and she thought she was doing the royal family a good job, she was, she was serving them well, uh, but we know now, while she was still married to Charles, she felt that she'd earned the right to That's have liaisons. I never thought like about that. Like That's it. interesting, mm. isn't it? And, and being a bit of an thought. out... No, it didn't. No. And sort of being a bit of an outsider. I mean, Catherine was a Howard. Uh, she wasn't an outsider in, in that respect. You know, the biggest, most powerful family probably at the time. The but Dukes she was the real Norfolk. bottom yeah. of the pile. You know, yeah. she was the orphan, tenth kid, we think, of the second son. she yeah. come from nowhere. And that's a similar sort mm. of setup, really, yeah. Which, yeah. We should yeah. explain yeah. that the story's told through the eyes yes. of her lady-in-waiting. Yes. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. that you, you, you got your inspiration for that idea from a bit of research. What was the line that, that you read? Oh, it's quite chilling, I think. When you read, and I can't remember, of course, badly, who, no. who wrote it, but one of the two or three men that were doing the interrogations mm. at the time that 
when she was being interrogated, wrote to another one, uh, Mistress Tilney has served us well. Just that one line. Now, I knew that Catherine Tilney had come, had grown up with Catherine Howard and come with her. Uh, As lady in waiting. Yeah, and I thought, what, what does that mean? How would she serve the interrogators well? So I, I have a feeling she was probably the one who cracked, because someone cracked, hmm. uh, someone cracked and, and way, betrayed what was going on. The way you uh, portray Cat Tilney um, in, in the novel is someone who's a who's a uh, totally different from Catherine Howard, yes. but but a huge friend and deeply concerned for her, and is absolutely astonished when she finds that um, Catherine is actually sort of saying, well, I'm going to sleep with Thomas Culpepper, her lover at the court, and a great favourite of the king, ironically. Um, yeah. So you can have Thomas Culpepper's bed tonight. Um, and so she, with her mm. cat, with her young lover, lover. Francis Derham, mm. mm. um, would have... And I just find it quite, all, all quite astonishing. But then I thought, well, they're all so young. Yes. And they're probably they're not teenagers. much to, and not much to do. You know, yeah. they have this yes. wonderful sumptuous <laughs> life, yes. and you know, and, and in each other's company and dancing and everything every night. So it's not really surprising that it became a hotbed of relationships. Yes. Yeah, like strictly come dancing, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, but seriously, a lot of a lot of close physical contact in in, in a bubble, yes. in, in an artificial world. Yes. And one more thing I'd, I'd like to ask you about because this was completely new to me. Now, Francis Derham is a historical figure, isn't he? Yes. Just like Thomas yes. Culpepper. Yes. Yes. And although he is in the book, he is. Um, Catherine's uh, lady-in-waiting, um, Cat Tilney's um, lover. Yes. He had previously been Catherine's. Yes, and he was. He, he was, was really? Catherine Howard. Oh, yes, absolutely. The only thing I've invented there, uh, and, I, and I put that at the front of the book to be clear, because I, I, if I were reading it, I want to know yeah. what sacrum, what's, what's made up, as it were, um, is, is that, that when Catherine Howard moved on from Francis Durham, which she did when she went to court, it was, you know, had enough now, thanks, yeah. Francis, which is what, how she operated with men. I mean, she very much instigated her affairs, and she finished them you know, when she, when she wanted to finish them. Right. She moved on, and I have invented that then her best friend has a love affair with right. Francis Durham, so yeah. that's the invention so, there. So but, can, but I, can I just ask yep. about the pre-contract, because that was yes. what I wanted to do. Because one of the things that I was astonished to find, that if, if it could be established that a young couple had pledged themselves to each other to spend the rest of their lives together, even if they weren't married, it made any future marriage yes. to anyone else invalid. It did. And that is what um, the, king, the king's... Um, servants and things decided that that she must have had this pre-contract yes. with Francis Durham, and actually, therefore, she was not legally married yes. to Henry VIII at all. Yes, that was the problem. It came up with Anne Boleyn as well. Actually, really? she had to be investigated mm. for pre-contract, and I think um, they never got further with this pair, Catherine Howard and Francis Durham, than than finding out that they used to refer to each other uh, as kind of wifey, and you know, uh. it, it was an affectionate way. But that was taken as enough yeah. for, for, as evidence of pre-contract. So. Yeah. Uh, as you as you wrote the end of draft three or four, whichever how many drafts you, you had to write, what was your final take on her and on on Henry? As, as, as real human beings who lived and did these things, what was your final take on both of them? With Catherine, my final take on her is, you know, she, she uh, trust me, she is portrayed by all historians, I think, as a silly little girl. Right. Um, and she was little and she did do a very silly thing. Um, but I don't think she's that at all. I think she was a, a very sexually confident young woman mm. and she was an operator and she uh, mm. she instigated her affairs, as I said to you. She she held everyone in thrall to her, um, I'd, even without meaning to to do it, I well, think. Well, then maybe that's the answer to the first part of the question. Maybe if she, if she was that, that heavy piece of work, maybe that's why Henry did in the end decide that she had to be killed. Yeah, yes. Too, um, too, too strong to handle. Yeah, well, no, I think he was horrible because I think he hadn't picked up on that. You know, he used to call her his um, rose without a thorn. He that's thought right. she had no history and he'd had all these complicated wives. You know, he'd mm. had a bit of a time with the wives uh, <laughs> so far. And along comes this little popsy with no history. <laughs> and then to discover that she has the most florid history of any of them yeah yeah he yeah. he was he was absolutely devastated and and everybody <laughs> says he was you know he went into one i mean he just went off and he cried and he wouldn't see her again he never saw her again mm. from the moment and then he chopped her head off yeah yeah <laughs> it took a couple <laughs> of months had, but had yeah. It done for him yeah yeah having a toothpaste put on your brush for it um, Susanna, thank you. Susanna, thank, thank you. you. It's, 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 thank I mean, I have to tell you that I, 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 this is true of all of our book club reads, not all of them, but many of our book club reads. You find yourself reading a book that you wouldn't normally have picked, and then you think, oh, I'm so glad I got this. And a lot of our readers say the same thing, and it's the same with this. I'm not that big a fan of historical fiction, but I, but I am now. It's fantastic. It's a great read. Thank you. And you can uh, learn more about this lady here and uh, what we really think about the novel, which is very positive, <laughs> in our reviews and what you're saying about it on the website. It's uh, www.whsmith.co.uk forward slash Richard and Judy. It's a, it's a really good read. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.